communities around various topics centered around intersectionality and social justice. This series plans to serve as a catalyst to promote, celebrate, and increase cultural awareness at Georgia State University, encourage cross-cultural dialogue and engagement, and advance global and intercultural fluency and cultural competency. Each workshop topic is uniquely designed and expertly facilitated to create a safe environment for authentic conversation, varying viewpoints, and cultural exchange. Selected guest speakers help to shift personal paradigms and facilitate learning and understanding through their scholarship, serving, service, and storytelling. The topics and speakers presented do not represent the views of the Multicultural Center and Georgia State University, but are intended to reflect contemporary social concerns. All are welcome to take part in these cultural conversations. I am your host, Alba Villarreal, and on this Talk Tuesday, we are joined with Rosa Clemente, a Black Puerto Rican woman who was the first Afro-Latina to run for vice president in 2008 and now serves her community as a well-known journalist, political commentator, and scholar activist. I want to thank Rosa for taking, her, for taking time out of her schedule to have this candid conversation about her experiences as a Black Puerto Rican woman. Rosa, could you please also introduce yourself um, right now? Um, yes, my name is uh, Rosa Clemente. I am an organizer, scholar, activist, independent journalist, and I am based in Albany, New York. All right, thank you so much. Before I go ahead with the questions, I do want to remind all the participants that you are welcome to when um, that you are welcome to participate in the conversation through the chat. So for the first question, I want to ask you, Rosa, is um, what does anti-Blackness in the Latinx community look like? And is it different in other communities? Well, <clears throat> I think anti-Blackness is worldwide. And I think um, that this past year, there has been um, an error made where all of a sudden Latino people are or Afro-Latino people are anti-Black. You know, the whole world's anti-Black. Clarence Thomas is anti-Black. Condoleezza Rice is anti-Black. Donald Trump's anti-Black. So, you know, um, and I think it's a dangerous narrative because it really fulfills the first, first tenet of um, white supremacy, which is divide and conquer, as opposed to looking at especially the last hundred years of social justice movements in this country, where we have always been in step with other of our African and indigenous descendant people. You know, so I think the conversation is important to have, but we also have to recognize that if like a Puerto Ricans anti-Black and African Americans anti-Black, neither of these folks have power to institute a system of anti-Blackness, you know, so well, I think it's a good conversation. I, I think it's been um, going in the total wrong direction in the last couple of months. Well, thank you. Well, you know, now that you said that a lot of people would agree with um, saying that Donald Trump is anti-Black, but expanding on Condoleezza Rice um, being anti-Black, a lot of people would be confused about that notion. Um, could you maybe expand a little bit more just on that? Yeah, I mean, people like Condoleezza Rice uh, or even someone like Hillary Clinton, right, who is supposed to be a feminist, but many of her policies were against women, especially her policies in the Middle East, where women are the ones that disproportionately are affected by bombings of, of their families, their homes, their villages. Uh, and so that's why we have to talk about anti-blackness and white supremacy as systemic things. They're not individual. And it, you know, so even the system of white supremacy, there are many, I'm so sorry, my phone just rang and I thought I turned it off. So I um, believe that whether you're black, Latino, Asian, like you can choose to participate in white supremacy systemically, you know, and, and, it's it's the best way I can explain this is that 
President Barack Obama was a black president who deported the most Latino people, right? So he participated in white supremacy. He helped build the deportation machine that this current administration ha has run on. And if you don't think about it in systemically, you will always individualize it and, and make that like an individual problem as opposed to a problem that we have to systemically confront and organize around. And there are many Latinos, Afro-Latinos in Black Lives Matter. There are many African-Americans that are part of Dream Defenders and Mi Gente. So <clears throat> if we don't think about it that way, we will get caught up in this kind of individualism where systems don't work like that. And also people who can who are oppressed can also become oppressors. Thank you. Um, and that kind of goes into my next question, which um, like, what is the first steps to combating that anti-blackness to steering away from participating in these institutions, essentially these white supremacist institutions? Well, the first step is knowing who you are in the history of your people, you know, and particularly for black and brown people that history of oppression, you know, that's, we talk about oppression so much and we don't talk about resistance in the same vein. And that our, our, our communities do not begin with the middle passage slave trade or exploitation and colonization and genocide. You know, those are part of our history, but our history is not just that. And too many times, especially in the United States, you talk, we talk a lot about the systemic oppression, systemic racism, but don't talk about how in all of that, there's always been resistance. And the best example of that from the 60s would be Fred Hampton who was murdered by the FBI and the Chicago Police Department, who was 22 and was seen as the biggest threat to the United States government. And right before Fred Hampton was assassinated, he he started the Rainbow Coalition and, and people contribute that to Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson took that from Fred Hampton. And what Fred Hampton did was he brought groups together like the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, the Young Lords Party, the American Indian Movement, um, the Weather Underground, um, Asian Power Movements, the Chicano Movement. That's why he created the Rainbow Coalition, where he did focus on race, but his focus was showing that collectively we were oppressed by capitalism and militarism. And that's why he had to be assassinated at the age of 22 because movements were explosive. Like what we've seen in the streets this past summer still does not compare um, not only to what we saw post-civil rights movement into the Black Power era, we also saw that all these organizations also believed in self-defense and that meant physical self-defense. That also meant that if you know white people could carry guns for protection, then black people could too. And there's even a whole history, especially down South, of particularly African-Americans defending themselves from the KKK and white supremacists, not only with the organizing work, but also ready to physically defend their communities. And we often, again, don't talk about that. And rarely do people really understand what Fred Hampton did before he was assassinated at such a young age. So I'm here for your next question. I'm just turning off my phone so it doesn't ring, but I'm listening. Okay, great. Um, I was just going to ask you, I kind of already led into this. I was going to bring up um, the current Black Lives Matter movement and how even though it started in 2013 and it's picking up traction right now after the murder of George Floyd, and you kind of picked up with the evolution of what Black power struggles specifically um, and resistance. And I kind of wanted to expand more on that. Like, do you think that in comparison, like from the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement from 2013, would you say that there's more progress being made now than before? What is your opinion about that? 
Well, Black Lives Matter was a definitely necessary intervention. With Black Lives Matter, though, um, you know, we have to also remember the Ferguson uprising, Baltimore uprising, Charlotte uprising, that years before that, particularly young undocumented um, folks were putting their bodies on the line, risking being in ICE detention. And in fact, this great movie, everybody should watch documentary called The Infiltrators, where two undocumented um, people ended up going into ICE detention and undercover exposing the conditions there. You know, so movements like history are continuing, they go up and down. You know, I think the main difference, except for Ferguson, Baltimore, Charlotte, with organizations is that they mostly adhere to a Kenyan um, philosophy of nonviolence. And for me, Malcolm X taught us that when people are violent towards you physically, you have a right to defend yourself. With that being said, you know, that that these last six years with Black Lives Matter, there's also been the Dream Defenders, Mi Gente, the Marsha P. Johnson Institute, um, La Colectiva Feminista in Puerto Rico, you know, um, and obviously in Central America, um, from Brazil to every country in Central America and Latin America, there are uprisings. I mean, Chile right now is in complete rebellion right at this moment, you know, um, and soon Argentina will be in all these other places where the, the, the presidents of these countries are not just dictators, they are literally following the playbook of white supremacy, um, particularly put forth by Donald Trump and then Jair Bolsonaro in, in Brazil. So uh, well, the thing about Black Lives Matter is there's chapters in Brazil and in Canada and things like that. You know, um, the flip side of it is that most all these movements are being co-opted by corporations. Not that the people in the movements want that to happen, that that is happening. Like an example is, you know, Amazon saying Black Lives Matter and flying the African liberation flag, the red, black, and green flag at headquarters, and then firing Latino, Muslim, and African-American organizers who are trying to have a livable wage. And yesterday there was a march in LA led by Christopher Smalls, one of the people we first saw fired from Amazon. And he was, he, the, the thing he did was just try to organize to get PPE at first for his colleagues in the Staten Island, New York distribution center. Amazon saw him as such a threat. They had an entire upper level executive meeting that was secretly recorded and in that recording, it listed the steps that Amazon had to do to discredit a 24-year-old Black man who was trying to make sure his colleagues weren't dying, you know? So what the movements have also done is put particularly elected officials on notice. And But I also think a big mistake right now is that most organizations are so um, into elected electoral politics and voting that the organizing is now missing, the grassroots organizing. And um, that's very dangerous when you depend on the system to give you freedom from the ballot. Um, and we also recognize like Georgia is the perfect example. There's been more purging of black voters like Stacey Abrams literally won the election and it was stolen from her. So um, Georgia has been a, a way that particularly Republican governors are finding how to continue to disenfranchise, particularly African-American and Latino voters, you know, and the over reliance on the vote, if that's going to be what people are focusing on, which is fine for the next 29 days, I hope that as many poll watchers as the right wing is sending that um, Democratic and other people are sending also to poll watch, you know, and I haven't seen that from the Democratic Party. I haven't seen Kamala Harris or Joe Biden the way we're seeing Trump, even though everything is like a movie and scripted really well. And and that is going to be dangerous. You know, it, it, it's going to first intimidate people 
from not going to the polls, but also it's intimidating if you're going to a poll somewhere in Georgia that's not a big city and there's five white supremacists with guns calling themselves poll watchers. And um, I think it's gonna be a crazy time. And I think the day after, no matter what, our movements better be prepared for like a white supremacist right wing physical violent attack all over this country. They're already, they've been coming to protests to target practice and prepare and literally blend in to the point where you don't know if that's actually a police officer or a white supremacist. Although I would say that there are a lot of white supremacists that have infiltrated police departments. And so that's the situation we're in. And we cannot continue to have our movements try to appeal to morality. They have no morals, none. They have no ethics. They are white supremacists from the top to the bottom. So our movements try to continue to dialogue. They're not trying to talk. They're trying to kill us. You know, so right now we have to prepare for that. And with all that said, all of us have to vote. And I'm a I I I am a third party member. I'm in the Green Party. But this year I, I endorsed Julian Castro and then Bernie Sanders. And for sure, as much as I don't want to pull the lever for what I think are two corporate Democrats, um, especially Biden, who continues to um continue to castigate protesters and organizers as opposed to castigating who he should be, um, these paramilitary militias, I think it's turning off a lot of young people. The more he talks about, if you burn a building, you're also like the right wing, the more young people are gonna be like, uh, you don't represent me either. And there's a reality to all this that I think people who are particularly work in democratic politics are not understanding that this person, Trump might win again, and it won't be our fault. You know, it won't be the fault of Black Lives Matter. But to put Black Lives Matter in this whole context, first, Black Lives Matter started under a Black president, period. Second, Trump has used white supremacy and dog whistles against Black Lives Matter, Mi Gente, and all these organizations, and that these white supremacists are even starting to find out where many of us live to threaten us. But as well, we're seeing in many places right now, we see it in Portland, but just last night, Washington police went into 20, did a raid on 20 protesters in different parts of Washington, D.C. For what? Because the attorney general is now labeling protesters as terrorists who will use sedition, which the law of sedition just means that you're talking about um, or you're going against American propaganda. So they're already beginning what we call pre-arrest. We've seen it. It's real, and then we don't know where people are disappeared to for days. And then they're just like released blind, with the blindfolds on somewhere and they never knew where they were. Um, and that's happening, you know? We have to be ready for a whole scale of massive military and the state coming at us at every way that they can. Thank you so much for that. That was a lot to unpack. And um, I do have a question from the um, someone in the chat. They wanted to ask like, what the name of the documentary was that you asked, uh, that you mentioned earlier. If you could just repeat that and maybe you could write it down in the chat. Yes. It's called The Infiltrators. It premiered yesterday on PBS on their point of view series, but um, it's available now. I'm almost thinking it's probably available on Netflix already or Amazon what is called the infiltrators. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And we also have another question from a participant. She's, they're asking, um, would you recommend that protesters come armed or remain unarmed? Well, there are protesters who are armed already, especially in Texas. 
Um, and, you know, we could look at the case of Breonna Taylor and what happened, right? Um, where her boyfriend legally had a gun and it was registered. You know, um, I think it's controversial, right? People find it controversial to be like, should you be armed? My take is yes, if it's legal in your state, sure. You know, um, but also in saying that you also have to be trained as an organizer of what that actually means, you know? And I don't mean like carrying AR-15s and all of this that these militias are doing. Um, I, I do recommend that people literally know how to defend themselves physically. And we saw this happen when Kyle Rittenhouse shot those two protesters. You know, one of them was, you could tell in the video, he knew some self-defense methods and tried to unarm him and got shot and died. Um, and then following a week, a couple of weeks later, the other person who lived and, and, and tried to stop him was then killed by the FBI and all these federal agencies who found him and surrounded him, did not give him time to quote, give himself up and assassinated him. You know, so I think, you know, and I understand the gun violence problem in this country. Um, so I think if you're gonna go out there and protesting, not only do you have to be secure, like you have to wear a gas mask. You cannot have a phone on you. You have to be aware of drones. You have to be ready to maybe physically defend yourself, you know, with your own body. And part of doing that is being trained. And there are people all over the country that are training people in what they call nonviolent intervention, which what I, I, I would agree with that. I, I do think it's nonviolent when you're literally trying to defend yourself against a white supremacist that's trying to punch you with brass knuckles, you know? Um, and it, it just requires a level of, of training to, to defend yourself and also be able to just de-escalate situations because all these protests have infiltrators in them, right? On um, that come to disrupt. And you have to kind of figure out, well, who are these people and how do we end up trying to de-escalate de a situation before it goes the way um, a lot of these rallies have gone because of groups like the Proud Boys who are really just ne neo-Nazis, right? That's what they really are. And we'll for sure touch more on that in um, later this hour. Um, we have another participant who wants to ask a question and we're gonna actually unmute her. So Cameron, um, if Cameron Bieria, if you could please unmute and then ask your question, that'd be great. Or um, we'll unmute you, I mean. <laughs> oh, hi, um, I'm Cameron, and I want to know how do we go about finding grassroots organizations in our areas? They're Google, they're all over. I mean, we there's organizations everywhere. I get asked that a lot by, by younger people, students, and I'm just like, there's Black Lives Matter chapters everywhere. Um, Southerners on a new ground down in, in base, based in Georgia, um, in Atlanta, um, standing up for racial justice. If that group is particularly for white people to fight against white supremacy and anti-black racism. Um, Dream Defenders, like I said, Mi Gente. I mean, if you want to go old school, kind of moderate, even a little conservative, the NAACP. I mean, there's so many organizations out there, a lot of grassroots organizations. And if you live in the community, you usually know an organizer or you've heard of an organizer and you could just ask, you know. Um, but there's no lack of organizations that are out here on a daily basis doing incredible work. Okay, perfect. Um, and just to go off of that community organizing, like for sure, um, the one thing that I kind of do is just on Instagram, you could just, the first steps are always um, yeah. following their local chapter Instagrams. And they always have like infographics on how to get involved, especially right now. Um, so that's something that 
I for sure want to get a part um, to be a part of in the future. Um, we also have another question from Kayla Anthony. She wants to ask a question. Let's unmute her as well. Oh, hi. Um, my question for Rosa is, um, how do you feel about Joe Biden, um, like on his campaign trail, in a way pandering to minority voters? I know that um, he's working with a lot of, like, for instance, when he's trying to get black voters, he's talking to rappers and musicians that we generally like to listen to um and i guess if we go into more so like the latino community um well both black and also mixed um he's having rallies he's bringing on like ava longoria um i think jay balvin was i think a part of his campaign and i know he had like a, there was a little people were making fun of him um, at an event where he had a Latinos for Biden rally and he played like Despacito through his phone. I don't really know, but it was, it just looked really awkward. So I just wanted to know like, what's your take on Biden kind of pandering to his minority audience to get those votes? Well, I mean, I, I don't even think he's really trying to get those votes. Um, first, we're not minorities. That that word, we have to stop using that. We're not minorities. We're the majority of the world's population. So, I mean, that is the first thing. Second, he's not pandering to Black people. He's pandering to white men who he wants to turn for voting for Trump and white women. And that's his biggest mistake. Um, and every opportunity that he has to really support, particularly grassroots organization, the only thing he's saying is that we shouldn't go and burn things down or we're worse than the right wing. Um, and none of this is gonna engender who they need to come out and vote, which are African-American and Latino young people under the age of 35. Um, and also I don't listen to rappers or actresses. Like I can't act and I can't rap, so I'm not going to listen to rappers or artists about who I should be supporting. I'm an organizer, you know, and um, I, I, un I understand they have their right to do whatever they want, like artists and do you, you know, be out there on the campaign trail. But these artists who are particularly millionaires cannot in any way understand the plight of working people. And what he should be doing is having working people like you don't go to florida still meet with cubans that are anti-black old school still upset that they cannot go back to cuba because they were forced off because they were the elite of that island and then totally skip the over four five hundred thousand puerto ricans who are legally registered to vote as American citizens. So you can't go to Cuba and then not talk, I mean, go to Miami, uh, the state of Florida and not talk to like Puerto Ricans. And that's exactly what they're doing, you know? And in fact, Trump, when he went to Florida, he announced that he was gonna give $13 billion in aid to Puerto Rico. Now, if he wins, is he gonna take it back? Of course he is. But now he's politically astute to be like, yeah, I'm gonna help Puerto Ricans because I threw paper towels at them. And I also, there's a whole crazy narrative of polling that's saying most Latinos support Trump. And I'm like, most who? We, we number 60 million. Who's the most that support Trump? Latinos? No. Black people? No. The 51% of white women who voted and got Trump into office are responsible for this entire mess that we're in. And we have to say that because we, especially as women of color, are very inviting and white women still keep doing the stuff that they do. You know, um, I think about if I'm in a room with three white women, like two of them voted for Trump, just on statistics alone. And I'm like, I don't wanna be in this room, you know? so. I think they're doing a very bad job. And I, I cannot understand for the life of me why we have not seen Kamala Harris. I'm like, what, like, is she in the bunker? Is she in the basement? 
what the hell? Because Biden last night at the town hall, unfortunately, he said a lot of wrong information. You know, he said like 200 million people in this country died of COVID. No, 200,000 people. There were a lot of missteps and he is looking more and more fragile. So as opposed to just saying memes of Kamala with Timberlands and Converse sneakers, can you let her talk? I mean, for me, they're both moderates, right? Kamala Harris is proud that she was the top prosecutor in California. She instituted a law that arrested parents if the kids were truants. And she's never lied about that. And for anybody to think that Joe Biden is a left or progressive has not paid attention to his entire career, especially what he did to Anita Hill. You know, so what's happening right now is we're literally stuck with two choices. Um, and if the Democratic Party had done the right thing, which is Bernie Sanders being the nominee, we would the, the Democrats would be 20 to 25 points ahead of Trump, eight points ahead. It's a statistical, it's a statistical dead heat. And the event of his COVID crisis and the movie that they released an hour after he got back to the White House shows how united the Republican Party is to make sure he wins, not how awful he is. It doesn't matter to them. Power matters. On the flip side, we have the Democratic Party who, for my, in my opinion, if I was even in the room, I would be like stream live the next 24 seven for the next 30 days. Have everybody coming on live on a live stream 24 seven. And it's not happening. And I, I, I live in Albany, New York. And in fact, this weekend, I went to the Catskills, which is an hour outside of Albany. And my daughter kept counting the Trump signs in New York state. 22 Trump signs on our way there. And we're not talking about li little flags. We saw a Trump <laughs> flag with an LGBTQ flag next to it. We saw Trump everywhere. Trump, all lives matter. And I'm like, this is New York state. But everybody thinks New York City is the state of New York. Past um, a, a county that we call Orange County, all of upstate New York, for the most part, is Trump territory. And in fact, the first chapter of the Proud Boys was founded here, and we ended up finding out about it and confronted them over two years ago. So, you know, as someone who has voted Green and ran on the Green Party ticket, it is extremely difficult to watch what they are not doing. And obviously they're just not listening to younger people in the campaign right now. They're just not. And it's really interesting that you brought up your run as um, on the Green Party ballot as vice president. Um, Cause my next question wanted to expand about that. And like, what did it mean for you to run for office in the Green Party as a Black Puerto Rican woman against Obama? Yeah, I mean, I was against Sarah Palin, so <laughs> John McCain too. Um, you know, it was Cynthia McKinney called me and asked me, and I was um, a little naive at that point, not in saying yes, but thinking that when I did say yes, and I would run on this hip hop political agenda that was created by the National Hip Hop Political Convention in 2003, and subsequently our um, conferences after that, I was naive in thinking that the same people I have been organizing with, gone to jail with for protests would support me, and they didn't, you know? Um, so when I look back at it 12 years, I if someone watches my speech, everything that the the quote squad of in in you know our, our our four sisters are putting forth are things that the green party had 12 years ago we started the green new deal we were the first political party to want equity and equality for lgbtq people 
for the release of Puerto uh, political prisoners, for Puerto Rican independence, for the Palestinian right of return. You know, so what I say now is that me and Cynthia were way ahead of our time, you know, and um, it, it was also, it was a, an amazing experience, but the backlash that happened even post the election was not, and it was very bad for me and Cynthia for the next three years after we ran and um, the amount of people, I guess that, you know, at, that we didn't have the work, but totally not only canceled us, refused to employ us, which is why both of us ended up going to get our doctorates and Cynthia got her PhD recently and I'm about to finish because the academy was the only place, at least for me, especially with black studies that, you know, called and said, you've done all this, you now need a break to process this, think about getting your PhD. And that's exactly what I went and did. And I kind of had to rebuild rebuild the work that I do in a very different way and also had to let go of a lot of my um, former friends and comrades who who just cut me off and not only cut me off, um, said pretty horrible things um, about me and my ability to work or even how I was raising my daughter and stuff. And that stuff happened and social media was just beginning. So it was bad, but I would gather if all of Twitter and all that existed, it would have been worse. And um, that I do like think that I was very naive and just assuming that the people that I have been with for all these years would vote for us. And lastly, we were never gonna win the election. We weren't even on every ballot, it's the Green Party. Our part of us running is to show to show how corporatized the Democratic Party was then. And now it's like on steroids, right? Um, with lobbyists and all that. And and what what this, uh, what is important to the Democratic Party and how their platform, if people read it, really read the platform, has really actually become more moderate and conservative than quote left or progressive. You know, we're in the situation was like now it's the lesser two evils. You know, so it's like, I think about growing up in New York City and we have a train that's the six. It literally runs from the tip of the Bronx all the way to Brooklyn, New York. And I'm like, well, the local train of hell or the express, I'm gonna take the local one. Um, and then I'm gonna be the person out there organizing the day after if Biden and Harris win to make them um, not only keep their promises, but to really, really push them at a progressive level that we've never seen uh, before. And if, if Trump wins, we just got to be ready to be organizing in a community. So, you know, and I still believe in the Green Party. I, I really do. I, I voted in the primary and all of that. But the Green Party, uh, the 12, since me and Cynthia had run, really didn't move forward in getting rid of a lot of the white old men in that party who were racist and sexist. And there just came a time where I was like, I'm not dealing with this anymore, you know? And I will never run for office again. Not just because I have that experience in the Green Party, just because I think the electoral political project is dead. We have the most black and brown elected officials ever, and this is where we are at as a people. You can't show me progress statistically because it doesn't exist when we look at statistics. And that's very hard for people to wrap their mind around, right? And, and especially in the COVID crisis. Um, with that, I, I, I truly hope that Biden and Harris pull this out and that uh, the next day we're out there even harder pushing them to do everything they need to do. Because the only way they're gonna win is by people like us or, they, or this election goes to Trump. Thank you for that. And it's really interesting that you brought up, um, you said to make sure that Biden and Kamala are not only held um, accountable, but they get held accountable for the promises that they make. But, you know, we're seeing in the most recent debate, Joe Biden go out and say, I don't support the Green New Deal. Yeah. And so what promises, like, it, it kind of brings into question us as voters, especially in this context in Georgia State University, young voters, a lot of us black and brown voters, 
what promises do we have to rely on for Biden and Harris, essentially? I mean, and that's that's why we have to be organizing if, if they get into office. I mean, the, another major mistake they're making is how are they not having AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Katie Porter, who destroys all these corporations, and Ayanna Presley, but particularly AOC. The only reason she won in the Bronx was because she went specifically and talked to the issues of young people in the Bronx and her district, which goes into Queens, New York. Why is she not out there every day with them? Why? Because they don't want to be labeled socialists. First, they're democratic socialists, so it's not full on socialism. Second, if the right wing is already calling you, Joe Biden, and you, Kamala Harris, a socialist, then F it. Go all in. Let our AOC say everything. She is completely missing because they are marginalizing her. You know, um, Nancy Pelosi and the leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus and Congressional Hispanic Caucus are not embracing this squad. And that is a major fatal flaw. So not only can he say, I don't believe in the Green New Deal, actually me and, and my Vice President Harris want to fund the police even more. Four cameras and all of this racial sensitivity training, which has been in effect for 20 years and has not changed a damn thing with the police. Like chokeholds have been banned. So don't tell me you want to ban chokeholds. They're already banned and it's still happening. And in fact, the other night, this brother in Santa Fe, Texas, Jonathan Price was breaking up a fight that he, a man was abusing a woman outside. The police shot and killed him 16 times. Where are they? Where, why aren't you in Ferguson, Baltimore, Charlotte, Phoenix? Where are y'all? You know, um, so the fact that they feel comfortable saying everything progressives wants, we're really not going to do right away. You know, where does that leave us? Almost no choice. It's either annihilation or getting these two in and making sure that we push them towards accountability and also all elected officials like you're not going to slide into these offices as easy as you tried before. It's not going to happen, you know, and that's what we have to fight against or to, yeah, to fight against them being moderate as opposed to progressive, as progressive as you can be as president of the United States. Yes, exactly. And I'm looking at a question that a participant um, asked, and I kind of want to bring that up, but also kind of push it. Um, they're basically asking how to encourage voters to vote for the best candidate rather than not vote at all and kind of posing do you what do you think of young voters specifically exercising their right essentially to not vote because as you we've spoken about we have just these two choices where biden won't it won't go full stop won't um embrace at least the leftist people um the leftist organizations that kind of supported bernie and where do we go from there essentially in the last election less than half the people who could vote voted i'm never one to shame people who choose not to vote you know i choose to vote other people don't and if half of the population that can vote chooses not to, who's the problem? <laughs> Them or the people who are working in electoral politics that forget regular folks. And I mean regular where there's no visibility for them, um, no uplifting of their work and no economic conditions are, are changing. Oh, and, and also let's not forget that Joe Biden is against Medicaid for all. 
which is the craziest thing with this crisis right now. Like after what Trump did yesterday, Biden and Harris right now should be like Medicaid for all, everybody, right? Um, this is a, but they're not gonna do that. I don't even have to watch TV to know they're not gonna do that. Because like I said, they're trying to go after uh, disaffected Trump voters as opposed to saying, why don't you target your message to half of the population that doesn't vote? Like, do that, speak to them. Um, so it's a personal decision, you know? And like I said, I'm not one to shame voters. I am not one to be like, oh, if you don't vote, you're the worst human being ever. You know, because a lot of these people that also push voting, they're pushing, what are they doing after we vote? Like voting is important, but what you do the next day is the most critical thing and the days after. You know, and we need that. We need people to vote, but we need people to be organizing the day after. Even if we had, quote, the best president ever, even if Bernie was the nominee, we would have to push him more on racial justice, you know, and, and that every time he was asked a question about race, he deflected and went back to, quote, the working class, which we make up anyway. It's not white men that make up the majority of the working class in this country. You know, so I think, um, again, they're just not enthusiastically engendering younger people. And, and that's what we need right now. Everybody right now is in serious mental health crises. I don't care who you are. There is no way after all of this and now beginning to understand we could be in this till 2021 or 2022. We don't know what every day looks like, let alone every hour. Uh, and, and it's really, it's hard to, to get people to say, well, you know, we're going to vote these two folks in and everything's going to be okay. Even if they do everything right, most of us are not even going to be, have the privilege of getting a vaccine. We're going to have to wait a year to two. You're talking about 300 million vaccinations plus, plus the rest of the world competing for the vaccinations, which really shows that the system of healthcare is literally chaotic and it's not even healthcare. You know, um, somebody I know called it sick care. That the only time you can get care is when you're sick, unless you're like Chris Christie, who I didn't know you could check into a hospital. I didn't know I could go into a hospital and be like, I'm not feeling good, check me in. You know, like the fact that he's a Trump supporter has COVID and was like, I'm going to get checked into the hospital while thousands of people in Jersey have died because they couldn't go to the hospital shows the insanity of this moment right now. So for me, vote if you want, you vote the next day, you do the work. If you don't vote, I hope that at least you're part of an organization or a grassroots movement in your community that pushes not only the people who voted, but pushes your elected officials in your community to do the right thing for the community. Perfect. You know, I completely agree with you on that standpoint. Um, and I kind of want to shift gears a little bit. We did discuss um, Puerto Rico earlier after Hurricane Maria. And, you know, I think around September 18th, Trump, the Trump administration, you said, gave $13 billion in relief efforts. And many people were criticizing him that it's too late, while others are like, just be happy that we have something. Um, and I kind of wanted, and you mentioned, he'll probably take it back or do something after the election. What else do we expect from this relief response? Like, how, how do you feel about it as a Black Puerto Rican woman and how this identity has shaped your activism so much. Yeah, either president, um, they they don't care about Puerto Rico, you know, and of course, Trump and his administration didn't care, but I, I don't see a major difference, particularly with the Democratic Party, especially when um, a bunch of them voted for PROMESA, the bill that, that Obama signed that actually got us into uh, where our finances are controlled by a fiscal board of seven white people in on Wall Street make all the decisions now of how money in Puerto Rico is going to be spent. 
Puerto Rico has been in an economic crisis before Hurricane Maria. It's been exacerbated, and the demand of Puerto Ricans is to cancel the debt. Um, I go beyond that. I say cancel the debt and give us reparations for the 117 years of colonialism and everything you've done to destroy the island, militarily, socially, and politically. So with Puerto Rico, post Hurricane Maria, though, the, I think that I don't think I know the consciousness of people changed on the island. First, after Hurricane Maria, we saw that there were a lot of young people that lived in the United States and had repatriated back to Puerto Rico. So when Maria hit within hours, there are already in all the municipalities were community groups preparing themselves not to get help from the federal government. There was also a generation in Puerto Rico that would say consistently, what would we do without the United States? We can't be independent. Well, we saw exactly what we do without the United States government, exactly what everybody did after Hurricane Maria, which was self-determination and mutual aid. With that, you then have last summer with the text messages of Jose Joe and his government, that was more about those text messages. It was really about Jose Joe's complete corruption, as well as some of the mayors having goods and never handing them out to people where they hoarded it for themselves or put them in warehouses. And we've seen the uncovering of that. So when the protests happened last year, it was the most that I have ever seen in Puerto Rico of young people, of black Puerto Ricans, of feminists, of cancel the debt, of independistas come together with one goal. Jose Joe has to go. And we won that battle. We won that battle. And to be in Puerto Rico when that happened is the highlight of all my years of organizing. And every so often you, begin to hear people say, oh, now Puerto Rico wants to be a state. First, no, and second, it will never happen. And the main reason it would never happen is not only the people. If it happened, we would have to change our national language, period. Uh, we, we could only do everything in English, you know, and we couldn't follow the Puerto Rican Constitution, which can be invoked when America tries to impose its um, constitution on us. Um, as a Black Puerto Rican, you know, it, Luisa it, it, and La Pela are the two places where you see the most people of African descent and you see how poorly they're treated by, by, the, by the Puerto Rican government, let alone the U United States federal government. But when Hurricane Irma and Maria hit Luisa, Luisa was the first municipality that was online and has surveyed the entire community. So they were already ahead of everybody else, except another part of Puerto Rico where this organization has already set up like solar panels. And now what we're seeing is um, um, farms exploding because younger people are like, we don't need to import food. <laughs> we can grow our own food. We don't need an electrical grid. We're an island. We can be powered, not on renewable sources of energy, but by the sun. And all these things are happening in Puerto Rico, but in the politics of the United States, when we talk about Latinos, Latina, Latinx folks, the conversation is mostly Mexican centric and immigration centric. And those are two, obviously the Mexican population is the highest population of brothers and sisters and non-gender conforming people and immigration is critical, but it, our issues are not just immigration, especially with Puerto Ricans, which a lot of us have to fight for older Puerto Ricans to be like, listen, what's happening to our brothers and sisters being deported, we have to be the front line supporting them and not, um, expose and ex ex expose anti-immigrant fervor. Um, so my identity is key to everything I do, you know, but for me, Puerto Rico, I, I fall under Puerto Rican nationalism where we believe islands should be free, but also I understand the repressive tactics that the United States 
has put on independistas and, and even the younger generation. And May Day of not this year, May 1st, but May Day of the year before, there's a famous picture of thousands of young Puerto Ricans. When they got to the police line, they pepper sprayed a woman and children in their faces. And while doing this, they were raiding activist households and, and arresting activists. People don't understand that the Puerto Rican police, in terms of United States and our, the colonies, are the worst police. They've been under federal investigation like every couple of years. And that lastly, in Puerto Rico, the, the femicide that's happening in Puerto Rico, we are now have the highest rate of women being killed by men, their partners, or transgender queer people being killed by other Puerto Ricans. We have the highest rate of femicide in the Western Hemisphere right now. And if it wasn't for uh, Colectiva Feminista and all the Center for Puerto Rican investigative uh, reporters, we would not know this unless you went to the island. And I went, we went to the island after Hurricane Maria, 12 days after I put a group together of all younger journalists, and we were there for 10 days, really exposing and telling the truth, including the number of Puerto Ricans that died. Because Jose Joe, until he couldn't lie anymore, said 61 died. And now we know from Harvard reports that over 4,600 people died, but that when they do the final research where they have gone to every municipality, the numbers of people that died at after Hurricane Maria could be 8,000, if not more. And those people did not die when Maria hit. They died with the negligence um, afterwards of the federal government and also the corrupt government of Rosajo, his wife, and all his cabinet members. Yes, and um, your work is greatly appreciated. It's so important for you and your organization your fellow organizers, the work is needed. And um, I can only speak for myself when I say it's truly inspirational and amazing to just see that, see the work and um, you'll inspire many more people like myself um, to contribute to grassroots organizations across, right now, Georgia, um, mm -hmm. and in the, in across the country, hopefully. So we are, we should be wrapping up right now. I really enjoyed this conversation with you, Rosa. Thank you so much. Um, and for my last question, we talked about so many things, touched on a lot of things, but um, now I kind of, one of the most recent things that has happened that is the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And a lot of people took this opportunity to discuss women's reproductive rights, Roe v. Wade, but I'm noticing the exclusion of women of color from narrative. And, you know, what, my question for you is, what does the future hold for women's reproductive rights, especially women of color? And um, how do we amplify our voices, essentially, during this time? Yeah, and um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for sure was the foremost around fighting for equality in, in a legal sense. She also was moderate and sometimes conservative in her decisions, especially about returning land to indigenous people, right? And around the Voting Rights Act, around Citizens United. I mean, she obviously had many dissents. Um, the main thing is that this year has been the celebration of women getting the right to vote. And I simply say, you know, that is wrong. White women got the right to vote, period. And in that movement, they marginalized Ida B. Wells Barnett and other black women of that time, right? So black and other women of color did not get the right to vote until 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So first we have to say that. Second, we have to keep reminding like white women, like y'all need to take care of your white women that voted Trump in. And even if he loses, there's a lot of accountability that white women have to have for women of color. And that if this, this Amy Coney Barrett gets in, Roe versus Wade will be overturned. It's not hypable, it's exactly what's gonna happen. 
and we have to push ourselves especially in latina latino communities i mean i was raised a catholic you know most of us have our parents are very conservative around particularly abortion right and, and the right of choice but roe versus wade is not just about that it's literally about us being able to control our own bodies how we live in our bodies and how we share our bodies from sex workers to PhDs. We continue as women of color to be marginalized. Um, and there often comes in these organizing spaces and I've seen it very intimately with what people in the Women's March did to their three founders, Tamika Mallory, Carmen Perez and Linda Sassour. They basically pushed them out of the own march that they created. And one of the reasons they said was that Linda Sassour and Tamika Mallory were anti-Semitic. And once you're labeled that in this country, it's something you live with for the rest of your organizing career. What they did to the three founders of the Women's March also literally put their these three women life in danger. With to this day, they get physical daily threats that someone is going to harm them or harm their kids. So I always tell younger women of color, like we have to work together in solidarity. We might not all share how we want to do the work, but and then we have to understand that you cannot discount also the fact that we as women have the right to an abortion, whether it's medically necessary or it's just necessary because you don't want to have a child. That is okay. But if you want control of your own body outside of that, that Roe versus Wade, the only thing I can compare it to is read the handmaid's tale and watch the handmaid's tale show because this amy coney barrett is part of a cult where they call their women handmaidens i'm like oh they read margaret atwood's book like 30 years ago and i'm literally implementing everything she wrote in fiction which is not so fiction anymore and that just means that we cannot be worried about offending white women we just can't. And in general, we can't be worried about offending white people. Like our people are being methodically killed. If you're white and you have something against that, you're the one with the problem. If you're white and choose to fight along us while we'd lead you to a path of freedom, when black and brown people are really free, everybody else is free. So we have to be prepared for the overturning of Roe versus Wade and a lot of other things that are literally gonna take our reproductive rights away from us as women or trans and queer folks. Thank you so much for that. Um, we are wrapping up now. If anybody wanted to ask Rosa something that didn't get the chance to, you are coming back for um, this Thursday for a, um, another speaker series. So please join us then. You'll have another opportunity for questions and answers. I know I can't get enough of listening to Miss almost Dr. Clemente. Almost Dr. Clemente. Um, Let me just say this, um, follow me on social media, but I, I really appreciate um, you interviewing me because it's obvious that you did your research. And if you're gonna be a journalist and ask questions, um, that's critically important. I am that way too. Um, and I really appreciate that you put time and effort into the questions and everything. So thank you for what you're doing. And I'm so excited. I was supposed to be there this year and live in person, but I will be there on October 8th. And if you go, if everybody here in Georgia State, uh, give Dr. Akinyeli Emoja some love. He's one of my mentors and one of the greatest people around black history and the history of our people and Georgia State is super lucky that they have someone like him there. So check him out if you don't know Dr. Akinyeli Amolja. 
Great. Um, well, thank you so much for those kind words that, that like made me blush a little. Okay. Um, but uh, I just want to tell everyone if you're planning on attending this Thursday, the meeting password is one, two, three, four. We will get that out. And I just I'm really thankful for this opportunity. Thank you so much Rosa, and, um, for your kind words and just the conversation we were able to have was truly amazing. Um, we can start wrapping. Oh, we are wrapping up right now. <laughs> Well, thank you. And I hope to see, or if I see people, but I hope people uh, join us on the 8th. There's a bunch of activities happening. So I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Uh, follow us on social media. We're going to call her Dr. Clemente pretty soon. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining us for this rendition of Talk Tuesdays. Please come out to more Multicultural Center events. We have so many coming up and I'm just, just so thankful for this opportunity. So thank you. Um, I will end the meeting. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who attended. And thank you so much, Rosa, for joining me again. I cannot thank you enough. <laughs> thank you, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, bye.